From VQR and the Center for Media and Citizenship, this is episode one of Circle of Willis, where, to the best of my ability, I respond to the question many of my colleagues have been asking me, which is, why are you doing this? Son, don't let don't let this cigarette around that gasoline. This is me and my friend Nick making explosion sounds over and over again by blowing into a microphone. And uh, judging from the intensity of our laughter, uh, this activity was the airy height of humor back then. We were uh, about 15 years old and uh, bored out of our skulls in the Spokane Valley, state of Washington, where there isn't much uh, to occupy a busy adolescent brain. The way that, the, the, way the joke went was this. You, what we do is, is we'd come up with, a, with any scenario that might plausibly involve an explosion, and then we'd blow into the microphone. See? That was the, that was the joke. Uh, you know, here, here at some point in here... Uh, we thought it would be fun to, to you know, rewrite the entire uh, first Star Wars movie this way. God damn it, Ben. I can't see a thing with the blast shield, man. So uh, I, I, I bring this up to introduce my longstanding interest going back at least to junior high school in, uh, in recording uh, time spent with my friends. Uh, something I, I've always liked to do. And, I, I, you know, it's, it's a niche a niche interest. <laughs> I, I laugh. The, the word niche makes me laugh. I, don't ask me why. Um, and and the, honestly, I've recorded literally hours and hours and hours of this stuff. Uh, conversations with, with friends where, where you know, we perform skits or we just, we just chat about school or unrequited love or you know, our shitty home lives, you know, sometimes, sometimes just sitting around making explosion sounds. It was a habit I formed and maintained sometimes uh, to the point of absurdity. So, you know, for example, in this clip that's going on uh, in the background now, I'm, I'm, I'm actually on the back of a motorcycle that is, that's, that's speeding through downtown Taipei in Taiwan. Let's see, it's about, it's, it's 1989. I think, and and I'm and I'm one of three people on the on the motorcycle, uh, which is being driven in this case by a Taiwanese buddy of mine that that I called Alex because he didn't much like the way we always bungled his actual Chinese name. Anyway, sort of scrunched between me and Alex on the on the bike is uh, Alex's girlfriend and my friend uh, Jean, and uh, in in the in, it's it's in the middle of the night, but you know this is Taipei, so the streets are are choked with cars and scooters and motorcycles and pedestrians. And, and I'm, not, I'm not quite sure about this, but I'm pretty sure that all of us are intoxicated. As we're driving along, the weight of our bodies is causing the bike to actually scrape on the road whenever we hit a bump. And we're, we're weaving really very unwisely through traffic and going far, far too fast. And one of the things that, uh, that I remember about this moment is that all the way through it, this entire uh, period of time, I was, I was literally afraid for my life. Uh, and yet, I'm, I'm still, almost pathologically at this point, recording the whole thing 
using uh, my little handheld Walkman <laughs> that I uh, was still carrying with me everywhere. I'm, you know, that's what I did. I don't know why exactly. I, I don't know why, but I've, I've, I sort of have always preferred audio to video. What do, what do you want? I don't, I don't know. Maybe I just like the way that audio evokes and augments my memories. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, why, so why am I doing this right now? Well, uh, it's, it's a little bit of what I just told you, and the rest is a little bit of a story. So I'm going to tell a story right now. Uh, it goes back a few years now. Uh, I was at uh, the annual meeting of the Association for Psychological Science, APS, uh, and, and I got depressed because uh, of an ongoing public conversation I was witnessing among my scientist friends about, about the state of science in general and, and psychology in particular. And, you know, there was this kind of activist movement that was beginning at the time. And it was, it was really, this movement was really sort of holding the whole field's collective feet to the fire about, you know, a, a bunch of perceived methodological shortcomings. Things like failures to replicate studies, insufficient transparency in statistical methods, all those sorts of things. And I was then, and actually I, I remain, really pretty sympathetic to this movement. I'm, I'm, I was um, trained as a methodologist many years ago. And, you know, anyway, it's, you know, how can you, how can you be against better methods? It's just you can't do that, really. So, you know, to my mind... It's, it's just never a bad idea to remind ourselves whatever we're doing, but I think particularly if we're doing science, to try and do better work. So that's, that was good. That was a good part. But, but I, also, I also felt at the time that some folks, often enough, you know, my actual friends, were, were, were not really helping matters, you know, in the way they were communicating these concerns. And I, I started to feel like the conversation was kind of devolving into a cycle of, of public shaming and defensiveness. You know, a, a cycle that, that seemed at the time, to me anyway, to be escalating. And, and also seemed to be mediated, uh, no surprise, largely through social media. You know, Twitter, and Facebook, blogs, that sort of thing. So it's kind of a long story. But, you know, I'm not going to go into all of it, but because you read about it elsewhere. But I, I, I wrote a, I wrote a blog post. It's really the only blog post, the only serious blog post I ever wrote. I don't know if I'll ever write another one. I, I kind of doubt it. Um, and this, this blog post I, I wrote mostly. Uh, the, the the whole first draft of it on the on the plane home from that conference, and it really basically argued two things. One, uh, I felt I felt it was probably best to uh, strive and maintain strive for and maintain a, a a reasonably high level of professional decorum and civility when when coping with scientific disagreements. I didn't think that was particularly controversial. Uh, but but I also thought uh, that I really wanted to say that w- you know, whatever else is true, moral outrage is is just it's no substitute for scientific rigor. Moral outrage I felt is is pretty easy, not a high bar for that. But scientific rigor is not so easy. It's hard. It's tough. Got to work hard at it. Got to earn it. If you if you'd like to read this blog and and you know who knows. There is a link to it at, uh, at circleofwillispodcast.com. How do you like that? Got a, got a website. Anyway, uh, at the end of my little blog post, you know, I thought maybe I should provide some prescriptive advice for how to move forward with the, uh, in the so-called sort of science debates. And, you know, maybe even repair some of the damage that had been done through bad behavior on social media. And... And as I sat down to write this prescriptive advice, what I found is that I really didn't have any. That wasn't very good. I didn't, I didn't really have any particular prescriptive advice. I mean, I guess other than, you know, maybe we should actually 
you know, like literally talk to each other more often, like, you know, face to face. Uh, it was really, it's the only thing I said at the end of my blog post. And, and it was a suggestion that seemed to me anyways, pretty benign, sort of obvious even. But uh, there were some, some really interesting objections to it. Where else? On Facebook, a Facebook uh, research methodology group. You know, uh, somewhere, somewhere along the way in, in Facebook land there, I got to reminiscing about great conversations I'd had during conferences, usually, usually at the bar uh, somewhere sometime after the, the day's events with fellow scientists. Uh, you know, these were, these were conversations where we discussed everything from methodological issues with this or that study to failures to replicate a given finding, whatever. And I said, you know, that these face-to-face meetings essentially never, ever included that, that rancor that you, that you see in online discussions now all, all the time. So I suggested that, you know, people just behave better when they're face-to-face. I mean, right? Is, is this, this, is, this is not controversial, right? We, we all know that now. We've all had, what, uh, you know, more than 10 years of Facebook, and we all sort of know that, that we, we're, we're better at disagreeing in person. Uh, and, and, but, you know, but in addition to that, I suggested that there really was no downside to uh, having face-to-face conversations. You know, so, so, you know, it was a, the big plus side was that we were able to actually talk things through uh, in, a, in, a, in a reasonably civil manner. And, and the, the downside was, well, there just wasn't any. I mean, it wasn't like we avoided talking about problems with each other's work. You know, it's quite the contrary. We, I talked about problems with my work with people at the bar all the time. But, but there was a problem. A wise Facebook friend of mine uh, objected to this point uh, on the grounds that those conversations that I was having face-to-face at the bar were, were private and that that was the rub here. For all the, the bad behavior that I think we were starting to see on social media, those discussions came with at least one undeniable benefit, major benefit, and that was that pretty much everyone has access to them. You know, by contrast, those those conversations that I love so much at the bar remained sort of bottled up, shared, you know, only among what might be a pretty elite club of folks with the resources and time to be there. So, you know, my friend said something like, you know, great, but but what about the grad student out there? You know, maybe maybe in a less resourced program or country who who never gets to hear your civil barroom tale of multiple failures to replicate some effect and who then goes on to make that same effect the 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 centerpiece of an almost certainly doomed dissertation and you know i was like huh well because i because I, I didn't really know what to say other than you know well, that's a pretty that's a pretty good point right there that's that's something so that, that kind of depressed me. Well, the, the path from that point to this one has been pretty long and circuitous. I, I, just by the way, I love that word, circuitous, circuitous. Great, great word. Anyway, um, I, I, what happened was uh, I started out interviewing some psychologists for a book project that my wife, who, by the way, is named Cat Thrasher, real name, that's her name, Cat Thrasher, uh, we, we started working on a book project uh, that, that we were thinking of doing. At the time, Cat uh, was a professional photographer, and we had sort of hatched this idea to interview psychologists uh, while taking their portraits. So in this clip that, that's playing in the background now, you can, you can hear her camera clicking away uh, while I interview social psychologist Harry Reese. And one, two, three, three. Uh, the, the sound of her camera, by the way, is so, is so deeply satisfying because she's using one of those old manual Hasselblad cameras with, you know, with the medium format film. 
She's just taking these amazing, amazing portraits. And uh, the, the idea of portraits and interviews was, I guess, really about, about sort of humanizing these folks as much as anything else. You know, we, we were, of course, we were into their work, but, uh, you know, with the interviews, what we were planning to do and with the, with the obviously with the, with the portraits was to really sort of delve more into their careers, you know, their personal lives, you know, to understand their personalities and, uh, and even show you what they, what they sort of look like, <laughs> not sort of, but actually, uh, it seemed like the best way it seemed to us at the time. Like, perhaps the best way to push back against what we perceive to be this sort of dehumanizing effect of social media, you know? But it it didn't take us long to realize that failing some very generous subvention uh, from somebody, our book idea was not affordable. We, we, uh, we actually stopped after only five interviews uh, because we just couldn't pay for the, the film development costs. Uh, and it's a shame, really. The, the, recordings, the recordings I made at that time, they aren't great because uh, I, was, I was originally thinking of just sort of summarizing them uh, for the book, you know, sort of quoting from them while I, while I wrote something in a, in, you know, a narrative format. But it's a, it, it, I wish I could play them for you right now because they're, they're also they're hilarious and moving and, and really deeply informative. Um, if I'd gone to Columbia, I actually would have worked with Stanley Schachter. Uh, you know, I, I keep thinking maybe one day I'll find a way to release them, but the recording, they're just not great recordings. So uh, the interview slash portrait project was scrapped, but the, the project did something to me. It, it, uh, it sort of reawakened that, that kid in me who, who used to just record uh, almost everything and who has still this, this vault of re- old recorded conversations with a bunch of old friends all made many years ago. I kind of felt that old addiction flare back to life. Um, and I was itching to do more, but I didn't really have a plan. You know, so I, I, didn't, I didn't really know how to proceed. On a cold, wet Monday morning, my friend Cherie Harder and I arrive at the University of Virginia's Neuroscience Laboratory in Charlottesville, Virginia. At some point, Barbara Bradley Haggerty of NPR News had visited my lab to record a story about some of the work we'd been doing. Uh, and obviously, you know, it's NPR. She, uh, she recorded the whole thing. She was, she was really interesting, and the whole experience was super positive and then a while later, I, I met up with her again in Washington, D.C. for a follow-up interview, which we, which we actually recorded in her car using one of her assorted high-end mics. And that, that was such a cool, I mean, in her car? That was such a cool experience that, that it got me thinking, hey, you know, this looks fun. <laughs> I want to do this. Uh, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't a particularly profound epiphany, but I did feel like it looked like fun. So I wanted to do it. And a little while later, a little little while after that, I actually wrote to Barb and I I told her that that I wanted to do that. And she was super encouraging and 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 actually gave me some coaching even. And what she did uh, was she really turned me on to the idea of a podcast. That she she's she said that you know podcasts were becoming a pretty big deal. Even at, at NPR, where people uh, really enjoyed the freedom that podcasts offered to, you know, really sink their teeth into an interview or or a story, and, and you know, after that conversation, I was sort of, I was sort of dazzled, to be honest. I I, I went I went out and bought some equipment. I, I started requesting interviews with folks and just got just got busy making some recordings. And uh, what has happened since that time has sort of blown me away. I mean, you know, I, these have been great conversations, at, at least for me. I mean, obviously, obviously, I hope that you enjoy them too, but, you know, whatever. I'm having the time of my life here. And, and I'm, not even sure, I'm not even sure what this podcast project is even about anymore. I mean, do I, do I still find value in humanizing scientists? Absolutely. Do I, do I still think this might be a way to sort of push back against the worst elements of social media? Yes. Yes, I do. 
but but I'm I'm mostly just I think just scratching an itch here right now. I love to talk to, with people about their lives and their work, and I and you know now I w- I want to record them. I want to record those conversations, just like just like I used to as a kid. I want to talk with my colleagues about their work, sure, but uh, but also their lives, their careers, their families. Really, you know, whatever comes up, I want to I want to contribute to a a collective understanding that scientists are sort of ever and always people first, you know, deserving of all the interest and sympathy and respect that that implies. But what I what I don't want, and, and I realize this goes against pretty much all of the advice for podcasters that exists anywhere, uh, is for this podcast to be about a particular thing, even even scientists. Yeah, I'm. You know, I, I'm. I'll mostly be talking with scientists here, but but I might chat with a some science writers too. Might do that. Maybe some journalists. You know, hell with it. Maybe 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 I'll talk with some poets and and novelists. I I don't know. If I want to, that's what I'll do. But you know, science science will probably come up. So so maybe that's the maybe that's the rock bottom thing that this podcast is really about. It's about science, sort of one way or another. But but if that's true, then I'd have to add that it's that it's also uh, about it's also about people, one way or another. And you know, I just I feel I feel strongly about that. I don't want to be pigeonholed. But so 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 you might be thinking, well, okay, that's all fine, Jim. You're a little excitable, aren't you? Yes, I am. Can't help it. That's what you get. But uh, but you might be wondering. So why is this? Why is this even called? Why why do you call your podcast Circle of Willis? And the answer to that question is I don't really know. I mean, to be honest, if I'm being completely honest, I just I just like it. Just like it. I think it's kind of funny. I mean, I guess. Okay. So back in back in 1989 or so. Uh, when I first learned about the the Circle of Willis, uh, sort of what it is, uh, I was I was knocked out by its redundant sort of design, uh, by by the way it had been sort of shaped by natural selection to ensure that the brain always had access to a robust supply of blood. Okay, and I'll say I'll say more about that in a second. But the but really the the other thing I loved about the Circle of Willis was that it kind of looked like a little I don't know, like a little little man, like a like a little a little blood man, I guess. Really, it does. Google it, or just go to circleofwillispodcast dot com, and and you'll see what I mean. But uh, so you know, the little blood man inspired a, a persistent interest in in the in, in the vasculature of the brain that really continues to to, to this day. I'm I'm not kidding. Uh, I was really impressed by that little guy. And 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 by the way, I also thought, hey, Circle of Willis would be a cool band name, and I tried to make that happen uh, for a little bit. That didn't didn't work. Didn't work out for me. And then you know, I guess more recently, I thought, hey, Circle of Willis would be a cool name for for a podcast, for my podcast. So, but, um, yep. Anyway, in in addition to to being a sort of a sort of cryptic and loosely metaphorical podcast name the the circle of willis is as i was saying a few moments ago the the key mediator of blood to and throughout your brain so there's a there's a cool answer about that uh and and as cool as that is i think it gets even cooler because you see the the circle of willis is also it's arranged a, a, as a as a redundant blood supply to the brain meaning that if any one part of the flow of blood to the the circle gets blocked other sources are able to compensate, and and that's why it looks like a circle, and you know, to me, uh, sort of like a little little blood man. <laughs> Look, I, I wasn't I wasn't intending for this introductory episode to be quite so rambling, but um, but that's how it happened, isn't it? And and I'm just gonna go with that because. You know, because because I'm still because my my day job is still, I'm, you know, I'm a full time professor, 
I'm, I'm, I'm running a neuroscience laboratory at the University of Virginia with, you know, graduate students and staff and things. And, and we're writing grants and papers and collecting data, all that stuff. The real thing. That's what I'm doing. And, uh, but, you know, but all, but all that's for another time. Right now, I just want to say thanks for, I don't know, exactly tuning in, downloading. What do you, how do you refer to podcast listening exactly? Should I know that? I feel like I should know that. Listen, uh, there, there, the, the main point is there, there are a bunch of really great conversations coming up in the next several weeks. These are folks like, like Eli Finkel, you know, Lisa Diamond, John Cassioppo, Judy Deloach, David Sloan Wilson, Nilanjana Dasgupta, Marco Iacoboni, uh, Brian Nosek, Lisa Feldman Barrett, Tanya Singer. It goes on and on. There's just a bunch more. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just naming names right now, and, it, and I don't want it to get too tedious. But trust me, there's a lot, there's a lot more coming. A lot of people that I've talked to, I'm talking to more all the time, and uh, it, it's, they're interesting. They're really interesting, and I, and I hope you like them. I think you will. All right, I want to, I want to thank a few people uh, for Circle of Willis. Circle of Willis is a group project in many ways. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Tom Stouffer and Gene Ruley for creating some really amazing music that we use here on Circle of Willis. Uh, and by the way, for more information about their music, check out the About page at circleofwillispodcast.com where you'll find a link to their Amazon uh, page where you can, you can actually purchase some of the music that you hear here, here at this place. That is to say. Now, uh, I also want to send out some special thanks. Uh, some special thanks, really, for their general support and and some some real, real rock solid resources. Uh, go to Siva Vidyanathan at the Center for Media and Citizenship, and Paul Rays of uh, VQR, Nathan Moore at WTJU here in Charlottesville, Virginia, and uh, and also for their invaluable advice and encouragement on this project. I'd really like to thank Lulu Miller and Barbara Bradley Haggerty, both of NPR News and, you know, I don't know, the, of the world where they continue to pursue, you know, a, real, a bunch of interesting independent projects. Thanks, you guys. And, uh, and that's all I got. Don't forget that Circle of Willis is brought to you by VQR and the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. Plus, Circle of Willis is a member of the TEJ FM network. Uh, you can find more about that at T-E-E-J... Dot FM. Okay, I'll see you at episode two, where I'll talk with Eli Finkel of Northwestern University about the history and science of marriage. Until then, see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>